Hello, my name is Susan Howell, and I'm the genetic counselor for the Extraordinary Kids Clinic at Children's Hospital Colorado, as well as a board member of ACCESS. And today I'll be talking about genetic counseling for X and Y variations and understanding mosaicism. So to start with some terminology um, is to make sure we're all on the same page. When we talk about um, X and Y chromosome variations and mosaicism, it's important to understand what a chromosome is. So chromosomes are the structures in a cell that carry our DNA or our genes. And our genes tell our bodies how to grow and how to develop. When we use the term aneuploidy, we're talking about an additional or a missing chromosome. And sex chromosome aneuploidies or SCAs are additional or missing chromosomes that are specific to the X or the Y chromosomes. We talk about trisomies in which there are three copies of the sex chromosomes like Klinefelter syndrome or XXY, XYY or trisomy X. And then we also talk about sex chromosome tetrasomies in which there are four copies of the sex chromosomes, often you, uh, depicted with a 48, either XXYY, 3XY or 4Xs. And there's a lot of different names for sex chromosome aneuploidies, but they all relatively mean the same thing. So in the medical literature, you'll see terms most commonly used is the sex chromosome aneuploidy or SCA, but we also use terms of abnormality, anomaly, disorder, variations. And then a more specific term or a more, I guess, obvious term is um, X and Y chromosome aneuploidy or X and Y chromosome variations that we often hear families prefer when talking about these collective conditions. When we talk about X and Y variations, we can see that the trisomies tend to be more common, um, represented by a larger circle in this picture, but we also see tetrasomies of a lot of different varieties, um, as well as even um, the 49ers having 4XY. And collectively, these conditions are relatively common in our general population. So approximately one in 400 live births is affected with um, a sex chromosome aneuploidy, the most common being Klinefelter syndrome with one in 650, as uh, the tetrasomies tend to be more rare or less prevalent. Um, and then the 49ers, the 4XY tends to be even more rare. Mosaicism really can be variable, um, and it, there's not a good number or study to reference the frequency of mosaicism due to the nature of the condition. So what is mosaicism? So my definition of mosaicism is an individual that has more than one genetic result. And so these results can be um, with a typical cell line in which you have 46XY, which is a typical cell line for a male, as well as some of the cells tested showed an extra X chromosome or 47XXY. And you can see this typical cell line with an extra Y chromosome in some of the cells, or a typical female cell line of 46XX with some of the cells having an extra X chromosome. So mosaicism with a typical cell line is thought to be um, helpful in the sense that the prognosis can be more mild. But when I think about mosaicism, I also recognize that there can be all atypical cell lines in which more than one result doesn't have to be that some of them are normal, but some of them can be abnormal as well. So we can see trisomies with tetrasomies in which <clears throat> some of the cells have an extra X, some of the cells have an extra X and Y, or two extra Xs, or we can see some cells in which an X is missing and other cells in which there's an extra X. We can see multiple cell lines as well in mosaicism, in which instead of just having the two findings, we can have three. Sometimes that's with a typical cell line and some, and then two different cell types that are abnormal, or sometimes they're all abnormal, um, but we can see two, three, four, lots of different cell types when we're talking about mosaicism. So how is mosaicism diagnosed? Diagnostic genetic testing is typically done in one of two ways. So it's typically ordered as a karyotype or a microarray. There's a supplementary test called a FISH test, which I'll talk about, which is sometimes ordered in conjunction um, with a karyotype or a microarray, but the FISH test 
standalone really doesn't tell us much. It really needs to be done in combination. So a karyotype um, is the study of chromosomes within a cell. So if we opened up a single cell in the body with the stained chromosomes, we would see a picture like this at the top. And then the lab puts the chromosomes into an orderly picture where we have pairs of chromosomes and they're numbered one through 22 from largest to smallest. And then our 23rd pair of chromosomes is labeled either with an X or a Y. And we have pairs of chromosomes because we get one chromosome in each pair from each parent. So one from mom, one from dad, one from mom, one from dad. So at conception, there's typically 23 chromosomes at, in the egg and 23 chromosomes at the sperm in the sperm. And at conception, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes or 46 total chromosomes. The Y chromosome carries the genes that drive male development. And in the absence of the Y chromosome where we have females with two Xs, um, then, then females develop. When we talk about mosaicism, a karyotype that would indicate mosaicism would have more than one result. So this chromosome um, karyotype shows three different results in which the first cell just had a single X chromosome. So that would be 45 X. The second cell had three X chromosomes. So an extra X chromosome or 47 XXX. And then the third cell type had two X's or 46 XX. So this would be an example of karyotypes resulting from a mosaic diagnosis. We can also do genetic testing diagnostically with a microarray. So a microarray is a microscopic test that uses these little probes that attach along the length of the chromosome. So this is representing the length of the chromosome one. This is representing the length of chromosome two, chromosome three, and so forth and so on. And what we see, because we have pairs of chromosomes, is we would anticipate that there's two copies of each dot or probe attached along the length. And so this represents two copies of the first chromosome, the second chromosome, all the way down. And what we see that's diagnostic in this result is there is an over-representation of the probes attached to the X chromosome. So this represents an extra X chromosome above and beyond just the two. So this would be three Xs diagnosed in this. And so that's how the microarray is diagnostic as well. The third test that I say um, is often in conjunction with a chromosome karyotype or a microarray is called FISH, and that stands for fluorescent in situ hybridization. And so FISH probes are specific probes that attach to a specific location on a chromosome. And once they attach, they're able to light up under the microscope. And so when you're testing with a fish probe, you're only looking for the presence of that specific area of the chromosome where it's attaching. So it really can't be a very informative test other than that one area. But why we use it in sex chromosome aneuploidies is it's a technology that allows us to be able to count the presence of chromosomes in a much more efficient way. So when we know that the fish um, probes are being used with a karyotype and we're looking for mosaicism, we're looking for how many counts there are. So you can see in this picture, there are two red, red probes lighting up and one blue. So this represents X, X, Y. And then in this cell, you can see X, X, Y, Y. And so this is a, a fish test is a way of representing chromosome count, but it also is able to look at hundreds of cells under the microscope, whereas a karyotype may only look at 20 or 30 cells. We can look at 200 to 500 cells using a fish technology that really can help hone in on um, the percentage of mosaicism in different cell types. And you can, you can see that just by the count of the probes lighting up under the microscope. So when we're reading a chromosome report, there's some language that I think is important to understand. Um, the abbreviation MOS stands for mosaic. And when we read through a karyotype, 
um, we typically see, you know, the first karyotype or the chromosomes, and then we see these brackets with a number inside that represents the number of cells, and then a forward slash, and then the second karyotype, and then brackets with the number of cells. So an example of that would be mosaic, in which the first karyotype is 47 XXY. So they found cells that had an extra XY or extra X chromosome, and there were 15 cells that were shown. And then the second cell line was 46 XY. So this is a, a typical cell line for a male, and they found five cells. So there was a total of 25 cells. Now it's a common question that families will ask me of, you know, does the um, does the number matter, the percentage matter? If we have majority of cells with an extra X and um, the minority of cells being typical. And the reality is, is that when we have mosaicism, we can't tell what all cells throughout the body look like as far as that concentration of one cell line or the other. It really just tells us that there's the presence of two. And we really, if we tested a different cell type, if this is a blood test and then we went to test a skin cell or we went to test a lung cell or other tissues throughout the body, which ethically we won't do, um, we might see a totally different number within these brackets. The last term that I wanted to draw attention to is this ish, which stands for the fish test. And fish probes um, are typically resulted as either a positive in which it lit up at a specific region of the chromosome for that probe or a negative in which it was absent. And so a common fish probe that's used can be the SRY probe, and that's specific to one of the genes that drives male development. So what causes mosaicism? Mosaicism results from a non-disjunction event in which the chromosomes fail to separate properly during cell division. And most of the time, this is after conception. So the egg and the sperm came together just like they should at the time of fertilization. And then those cells after fertilization grow and divide and grow and divide and grow and divide. And some of those cells become the placenta and some of those cells become the, the developing baby. And so when we have a chromosome misdivision or a non-disjunction after fertilization, if there's any kind of error in that division, some of the cells are gonna be abnormal in a different type of number and unique um, compared to the other cells. So you can see that Mosaicism then results in this picture of having two different cell types. And that's a, a kind of by definition where we see mosaicism. And how that translates throughout the body can really vary on how much is green and how much is blue. Um, it's more likely to happen when there's any kind of structural abnormality in a chromosome in the cell, like an isochromosome or a translocated chromosome or a marker chromosome. These chromosomes don't often participate in cell division like they should, and they're more likely to be lost. And so that can also result in cell, in, in cell mosaicism or um, throughout the individual, different types of mosaicism. Um, but it's not caused by anything that an individual would do during pregnancy. There's nothing that a woman would have done. This is not your fault. It's just a misdivision in the chromosomes in cell development. We can see a lot of variation within and between the conditions for the various karyotypes in an individual with mosaicism. So mosaicism generally, when it's present with a typical cell line, so those are the chromosome um, karyotypes that we would anticipate um, in a typical individual, that the condition can present more mild, in which that the presentation of the abnormal karyotype in those cells might be less um, obvious in symptoms. Um, but we can also see a lot of different percentages of each cell type throughout the body. And we can see mosaicism with atypical cell lines in which there are no 
typical cells. And so those sometimes can result in more symptoms of a condition. So there really can be a lot of variability in the features associated with mosaicism, whether they're physical features, medical features, developmental features, and psychological features impacting both learning and behavior. And it's important to keep perspective about this, that these are highly variable conditions, especially with mosaicism. So adding in mosaicism can make the, the prognosis that much harder um, to anticipate. And we do have a lot to learn, especially with this new technology and being able to identify these babies even before they're born about how mosaicism can impact an individual. We know that while, you know, the genes can impact our growth and development, they don't define us as individuals, that we have a lot of other family background genes and the environment in which we're raised that can really impact our outcomes. And that when we have a, a child who's identified early, we're able to be proactive in our approach to interventions and evaluations. And just keeping in perspective that children are individuals and they're gonna have their own strengths and they're gonna have their own weaknesses and their own challenges, and that it's not always attributed to the chromosomes being present or not um, in additional number or um, missing numbers. And that we see a lot of strengths in all of our patients um, again, you know, recognizing that that individuals and ch children are individuals um, and that our genetics don't define who we are. It, I just want to bring attention to the fact that genetic counselors can be very helpful um, in working with families who may have uh, questions about mosaicism or a diagnosis of mosaicism that often mosaic um, Karyotypes can reflect the need for follow-up steps, evaluations, or medical interventions, or screenings. And so they, genetic counselors can help in planning those next steps after a diagnosis, not just explaining the diagnosis. Um, genetic counselors can also help attribute whether or not some of the symptoms a child or an individual is experiencing could be attributed to the diagnosis or maybe not attributed to the diagnosis and warranting further evaluation. Genetic counselors can be very helpful in disclosure of the diagnosis, especially in explaining the diagnosis to the child in an age and developmentally appropriate way, um, as well as if a child needs any kind of advocacy in school or the parents need help in navigating healthcare, genetic counselors can be very helpful. And any uh, assistance that might be indicated as far as transitioning to adulthood can be helpful and then connecting to community resources. And then lastly, genetic counselors can work with families, especially when families have um, a, an individual with mosaicism as far as recurrence risk, because the mosaicism um, can be a lot harder to interpret on those re recurrence risks as well. There's a lot of great resources that are available through the AXIS website, um, as well as the XXYY project. And the Extraordinary Kids Clinic, our clinical website, has a lot of information that may apply to um, an individual with mosaicism. And then I included two additional websites because we do see mosaicism that has a 45X cell line, and that's a, a diagnostic cell line of Turner syndrome, um, often in combination with trisomy X, but we can see it in a lot of different cell types of mosaicism. And so the two other organization is TSGA or Turner Syndrome Global Alliance or TSSUS, Turner Syndrome Society of the United States, because these organizations can help educate individuals about the medical and developmental impacts associated with that 45X cell line. And then we've developed a series of books um, that are available online to help children understand a diagnosis and, and aid parents in disclosure of the diagnosis. And with that, I uh, thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.